General, before we begin, I want to say that yours is the best book I have ever written in advance of an interview with an author. Read. I've ever read. Thank you very much. <laughs> Although... I thought we were going to do your book for a minute. <laughs> Although I spent so much time reading it, I felt that I <laughs> wrote it. <laughs> and, and the reason is because the general actually gives rules for how to handle the press. And I'm going to read just a few of them really quickly. Number one, they get to pick the questions. You get to pick the answer. You don't have to answer any question you don't want to. Never lie or dissemble, of course, but beware of being too candid or open. Never answer hypothetical questions about the future. Never reveal the private advice you have given your superiors. Answers should be directed to the message you want readers, viewers to get. Their interviewers are not your audience. They're doing their job, you're doing yours, but you're the only one at risk. Don't predict or speculate about future events. Don't wash dirty linen. Do not answer any question containing a premise you disagree with. Don't push yourself or be pushed into an answer you don't want to give. If trapped, be vague and mumble. <laughs> well, General, now that we know the rules of engagement, can we begin? Uh, I thought because this is a Chicago audience, uh, there's an anecdote in the book. Uh, about Chicago that I'd like for you to, to relate, and it involves some visiting students. Tell us that story. We had a uh, youth program uh, in the State Department where we brought kids to America for a week or two uh, and let them go around the country, and we introduced them to different aspects of our culture and society and our political life. They watch Congress at work and do a lot of things like that. And there was this group of Brazilian kids, about a dozen of them, and they spent bunch of days going around New York and, and Washington, D.C. They came to visit me. I had them in my office. It was a, a cold January day, and they'd never seen snow before. So they were not terribly interested in what I had to say about anything. And so they went out and played in the snow. And then they came to Chicago. And uh, I caught up with these kids in Brazil about six months later when I was on a trip. I said to our ambassador, John Danilovich, let me get those kids back. I'd like to see how they enjoy their experience in America. So he brought them to the embassy in a semicircle, and I started talking to them and asking, these are very accomplished kids. You know, they're going to be presidents and CEOs and all that. And I said, that's great. You're all going to be presidents and CEOs. But tell me about your time in America. Did you see anything there that uh, really, really impressed you or something that made you unhappy, something you didn't like about America? waiting to see what kind of reaction I'd get. So they all paused for a moment, as teenagers will, and then one kid raised his hand and said, Mr. Secretary, I couldn't believe it when they laughed at me. They laughed at me when we were having pizza at a school for lunch, and uh, I put more ketchup on my pizza. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, we, we think that most pizza comes with a sufficient quantity of tomato sauce, and you don't have to put any more on. That's a little weird. And then another young lady said, well, I, I, I couldn't believe that they served milk with pizza. Who ever heard of serving milk with pizza? And I said, well, if time permitted, I would explain the American dairy lobby to you, but I, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> and then finally, a young girl raised her hand and said, Mr. Secretary, let me tell you something that happened to us when we were in Chicago. The evening we were in Chicago, we were just walking around by ourselves, not with our host or chaperones or mentors, and we went into a restaurant. I think it was an outback kind of a place. Could have been a rustler's, I'm not entirely sure. And we had our meal, and when the check came, we realized we couldn't pay it. We'd either gotten the exchange rate wrong or we didn't add it up, right? But we, there we were, uh, a dozen Portuguese-speaking, mostly Portuguese-speaking Brazilian kids in a restaurant in Chicago. Uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen to us. And the waitress came over, and we told her what was wrong. And she looked at us, and then she went away. And we said, oh, boy, we're in trouble now. And she came back a few minutes later, and she said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We thought she might have to pay it out of her salary. And we said, we couldn't let you do that. And she smiled, and she said, no, 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 no. The manager said to tell you that he's picked up the whole bill. He is so glad that you've come to his restaurant. He is so happy that you're in his city, Chicago. And he just hopes you have a great time here in the United States of America. 
The kids went away absolutely stunned, and they were talking about it months, years later. Nothing they saw in Washington or New York <laughs> or anywhere else impressed them as much as the generosity and the spirit of kindness that they experienced here at a restaurant in Chicago. We sometimes forget that we are our best salesmen, uh, just the citizens. And I was just saying to Phil that I was reading the Tribune this morning, riding in uh, from the airport, and there was an almost identical story. I don't know how many of you noticed it this morning, but if you haven't, read it later today. And it has to do with an elderly couple in their 80s from a country, I forget which country it was, but a European country, and they got on the wrong bus or something and found themselves way in the wrong part of town. Didn't know where they were, didn't know where they wanted to go. And a young couple spotted them and asked them what was wrong. Uh, and they said, we, we need directions as to where we're going. And so they explained the problem, and the young couple pointed them in the direction that they had to go to get to where they wanted to go. And they started walking. The young couple started to drive away, uh, and they realized that uh, they'd given them wrong information, and it was a much further distance that they had to travel. And so the old couple's walking along, and suddenly, as the story is, I recall it, a taxi pulls up and says, the young couple asked me to come pick you up because you've got to go further than you thought. And they get in the cab with this driver, and the driver takes them there. And when it's time to pay, he says, oh, it's already been paid by the young couple. This is what we're all about. Anytime we, you know, we think the world is down on us, you just expose them to you know, young couples in Chicago and restaurants in Chicago, <laughs> and we'll be all right. But the story is a Chicago story, and I, and I, and I love it. Because Chicago, you guys sort of have a hard edge. And you know, people wonder. But uh, the story that is a Chicago story, I can replicate it in any city in this country because we're still a pretty damn good people. And we take care of each other and we take care of others who are in need or who have requirements for assistance and help. We do it around the world every day in one fashion or another. And you sometimes forget that this is really who we are as a people as you read sort of the daily fights that we are in or disagreements in Congress or elsewhere. But when you kind of scrape all that away, we're still pretty good people as we have always been and will continue to be. And if we ever lose that, then we are in trouble. But I don't think we'll ever lose it because it's who we are as a people and as a culture and as a nation. Okay, excellent. Uh, General, okay. you should know that about uh, five minutes to one, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question for the general, uh, at about five minutes to one, we will, uh, we will take questions from the audience. But let's get to your book. And you begin your book by talking about 13 rules that have been helpful to you. And let me read the first three in, order that, in the order that you have them. <clears throat> Number one, it ain't as bad as you think. It will look better in the morning. Number two, get mad, then get over it. Number three, avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position fails, your ego goes with it. In short, accept that your position was faulty, not your ego. And I can't help but think of these three rules and I wonder if they might have been particularly helpful to you personally when you realized that the information you'd relied on when you made your famous speech at the UN, that that information was wrong. Uh, much of it was wrong. Some of, uh, quite a bit of it was right. But it was an enormous disappointment, not just to me, but to all of us in the administration when having made the case for war on the basis of the presence of weapons of mass destruction, they weren't there. And people were coming up with stories, oh, they've been sent to Syria, or they've been buried. They're, they're, no, they're not there. We, we got it wrong. Nobody lied. Nobody falsified anything. But we got the information wrong. And a better job should have been done by the intelligence community. My presentation to the UN was the most uh, vivid and visible presentation of the intelligence. But it's the same intelligence that went to the Congress uh, four months earlier and persuaded the Congress to pass a very in an overwhelming manner, a resolution authorizing the president to go to war if he felt it necessary. It's the same information the president used in speeches and in the State of the Union address. Almost everything I said in my long presentation the president had in the State of the Union address. And it was resting on a national intelligence estimate that the Congress had asked for and we had provided to them, and that was the basis for the resolution they passed. Our allies believed it, our commanders believed it, and the whole cabinet believed it. But it was my presentation that was given to the UN after the president had decided that war was necessary. 
that made the case to the rest of the world, and it's the one that's remembered. Nobody remembers any other presentation of this information. And so it was something that I get asked about every single day for the last almost nine years. Every interview I give, this comes up, and uh, I have to answer it uh, constantly. And so it is a burden I carry, but I can't, I can't, as I say in the book, I was Secretary of State when this all unraveled, and I had to keep doing my job. And so uh, you get mad, you get over it, and you essentially take the experience that was a negative experience. I call it a failure. It was a failure of the system, but it was a failure on my part for not smelling something that was out of place. But I only had four days to put this thing together from, from scratch. Um, but I consider it a personal failure. But one of the things I talk about in the book, and I spent a lot of time on this with high school kids and college kids and younger kids, failure and disappointment, uh, those are parts of life. You will fail at something, you'll be disappointed at something. The real issue is how do you deal with it? How do you get over it? And the answer is you analyze what went wrong, you try to fix what is wrong in the equation, what you did wrong, uh, and then when you've analyzed it, learn from the negative experience, then roll it up in a ball and throw it over your shoulder and move on. Always be moving ahead in life, look through the front windshield of life, not the rear view mirror, the side view mirror, because you can't change anything that's back there. You can explain it all you want, you can't change the indelible impression that's been left. I find youngsters um, finding it more and more difficult to do because so many of our youngsters now, uh, particularly I would say my grandchildren and your grandchildren and children, are brought up in an environment where you know, they are so protected and organized and whatnot, they, they don't get enough failure in their life. So when it finally happens, you know, some of them just can't believe it's really happening. I was speaking to a high school in, in Tokyo one day, a couple of years ago, and uh, they lined up all the smart kids, the honor roll kids, with their little cards with the questions on it for me that had been vetted by the teachers. And I did two or three of those, and that got boring. So I went to the back of the room where I usually hung out. And, <laughs> and anybody back there got a question? And a young lady rose, raised her hand. She's about 15 or so. And she said, General Powell, are you ever afraid? She said, I'm afraid every day. I'm afraid I'm going to fail at something. And I said, dear, we all fail at something. I fail at something every day, and I have some fear in me every single day. It's a part of life. And it's how you deal with fear and disappointment uh, that is uh, important. And you just have to keep moving on. So the rules that Phil just touched on, it will look better in the morning. It ain't as bad as you think. And as I say in the explanation of that rule, this isn't a prediction doesn't mean things are going to be better in the morning. They may not. They may be worse. <clears throat> it's an attitude. It's an attitude. I always tried to go home at night, leaving my office, chairman, national security advisor, secretary, with an impression left upon my staff. Hey, guys, we had a real bad day. It's going to be better tomorrow. Watch. We're going to make it better. So it's an attitude rather than a prediction. Get mad, get over it. I don't like doing business with everybody around me being mad. You don't get the best work out of people. And so I'm a human being. We all get mad. That's also part of life. So get mad. If you have to blow, blow. And then get over it and move on. Um, and the story I tell is one of my commanders, General Merritt, uh, made a decision one day that I really didn't like. I was a brigadier. He was three stars. And so I went to see him. Got to see you, sir. And I went and I, uh, General, you just made a bad choice. They shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have. I mean, can't tell you how upset I am about this, sir. I said, this is a great disappointment to me. And he listened patiently. And then he came over to me and he, he put his arm around me and says, Colin, well, you know, the best thing about a disappointment is you get over it. Now have a good day. <laughs> and he threw me out of his office. Um, and I've, I've never forgotten that lesson. And it's been repeated in my career many times, I'm afraid to say. But you get mad and you get over it because you can't do positive things if you have created a negative environment. And the other story in the book is about my, my French colleague, Dominique de Villepin, uh, foreign minister of France when I was secretary during those leading up to Iraq days. And he, he did a job on me one day at the UN. He really did a job on me. And the whole administration was mad. The country was mad at the French. You may remember, we're not going to call them French fries anymore. We're going to call them freedom fries. Yeah. <laughs> got one left. 
<laughs> We're not going to buy any more French wine. No more French wine. That lasted about a week. They went away. There. And everybody was mad at the French, and particularly at Dominique. And I was mad at Dominique. And we had some very, very tough conversations. Did it privately. Walled off a story for a couple days. But I couldn't let madness stay because I had to work with him and he had to work with me. And so the other side of the story is you have adversaries in life. Everybody in this room has an adversary of one kind or another. And Dominique became my adversary as we worked our way through the Iraq problem for the next several months. But I never let him become my enemy. I don't like enemies. I'd rather work with an adversary, try to accommodate their point of view while insisting on my principal point of view. Um, and uh, so get mad, get over it, try to make an adversary a friend uh, and not an enemy. And within a few months of that, I needed Dominique badly. We went into Haiti to persuade President Aristide he had to leave. The place was falling apart. And he resisted, but finally he said he would go if we would get him out of there. I'm home at 11 o'clock at night. Phone call comes from the ambassador. He's ready to leave, but we need a plane. Get a plane. We send a plane to Haiti ready for him. He gets on the plane with his family. Where do you want to go? I want to go to South Africa. They like me there. Okay, so the plane takes off, starts heading across the Atlantic. I call our ambassador in South Africa uh, and say, you know, tell your good friends there that uh, their good friend, uh, President Aristide, is on the way. Calls back 20 minutes later, they don't want him. Uh, they don't want him. No, they, they got an election coming up. They can't handle us, so he can't come here. So I got a plane at 38,000 feet over the Atlantic with no place to go. I pick up the phone again. I said, get me, get me Foreign Minister de Villepin. I get Dominique on the line. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning there. Ça va, Dominique? Ça va, Colin? What's up? Dominique, I need a country. Qu'est-ce uh, que <clears> c'est, <throat> girl? I said, I need a country. You get one of your Francophone, you know, they got great contacts in the Francophone Africa. Get me one of your Francophone countries to take Aristide, and he'll, he'll be hitting the west coast of Africa in about five hours, and he's got to go somewhere. He called me back in 30 minutes and said, uh, I got it, Central African Republic, they're waiting for him, no problem. Uh, except he has to leave after a few months, he can't stay there forever. And so Dominique came to my rescue. Now, if I had made him an enemy, we might not have been able to do that. And then we sent troops into Haiti to settle things down. And there was an American Marine Brigadier General in charge of it. And under his command were his Marines, some Army people, and a French infantry battalion commanded by an American Marine. Dominique made that happen. And so what I've tried to teach people in life and leadership is get mad and get over it. Always have a positive attitude. And above all, work with uh, people who may be your adversaries to become your friend. And as Phil said, the other rule was, you know, don't let your ego get so close to your position that when your position goes, your ego goes with it. It simply means if you're having an argument with somebody and you're, you know, you're really ready, you're getting it intense, in, in, in an intense situation. When the decision is made, if you have not won the argument, just assume that it was your position that was at fault and not your ego. And so always try to keep your ego one, one mile or so removed from the fight that's taking place. And I've seen this over and over and over again, because I would have people come in and argue with me about something, whether it was the military or, or State Department. I'd listen to them, and then I would make a decision, and somebody would lose. And you had to go out of that room thinking that, OK, that's what the general or secretary wants. That's what now I want and my ego is not bruised. He doesn't like my position, but he still loves me. My ego is not bruised. And I think that's also an attitude you have to convey within an organization. The 13th rule that, that Phil didn't mention, but I, th I think he's read it clear, uh, carefully, it essentially says perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. And it connects to the first one. Always think you can make things better. Always believe that things will get better. Always convey that kind of spirit and attitude in an organization and um, you'd be surprised how it will fuel an organization to try to do better things for you. General, one of the revelations in your book that is getting a lot of attention has to do with the fact that the National Security Council had never met and never would meet to discuss the decision to, evade, to invade Iraq, that there was actually no decision-making point. How do you respond to people who think that 
is inconceivable. The president um, had a style of getting information, uh, but when his experience with the information gave him confidence, and when his instincts told him this is the right thing to do, he would often make a decision without another meeting to discuss the decision. But here there was never a meeting in which a decision was made. There was never a meeting where we all sat around and the president said, this is the decision meeting to decide whether we're going to go to war with Iraq over this. There were lots of meetings discussing various options. But as Don Rumsfeld says in his book, and I think Dick has it in his book, and Condi has it in mine, and I have it in mine now, there was no single meeting where the president called us all in and said, let's go around the table. We did it for Afghanistan right after 9-11. We did not do it for Iraq. But we all knew where the president's uh, uh, instinct was taking him. And so he told me personally on about the oh, 13th or 14th of January of 2003, you know, we're going to have to go. We're going to have to take this guy out. The uh, UN is not going to solve it for us. He told us each individually, but there was really not a collective meeting. That's the truth. It was his, it was his style. You write, quote, before we invaded Iraq, we should have listened to more people with ground truth experience in the region and fewer idea-heavy big egos in Washington. Are you referring to Vice President Cheney, Secretary Rumsfeld, and others who were in favor? <laughs> of a regime change even in the absence of weapons of mass destruction? I don't recall the book saying that. <laughs> it was more than, it was just, it was more than just my, my, my colleagues, some of my colleagues in the administration. There was a great feeling among some of the experts and intellectuals in Washington that it would be easy. I knew it would be easy to get to Baghdad. I, you know, we had fought this army and brought it down to size several years earlier. My concern and the concern that many people had was, okay, you're now in Baghdad, what's next? And my conversation with the president, uh, both in open meetings and in a personal meeting with him in August of 2002, I said, you need to understand, Mr. President, if you, if you break it, you own it. If you take out a government by force, force majeure, you go in and take out that government, you're the government. Uh, you have responsibility for the 28 million people who are there. And so you need to be ready for that eventuality. His reaction when you said that? He was, he was touched. He was deeply moved by that. He, didn't, he, he had not uh, failed to anticipate that, but I made it very vivid for him. And he said to me, well, what should we do then? I said, take it to the UN and see if it can be solved diplomatically, through political means and diplomatic means, and not war. I tried to avoid a war. Uh, but I made it clear to him that if the UN was able to solve it, you might still have Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. Is the issue Saddam Hussein or is the issue weapons of mass destruction? If the UN says there are no weapons of mass destruction, then there would not be a case for war. Uh, and he said he understood that. And so several weeks later, he took it to the UN. We made a, he made a presentation on the 12th of September, 2002. Um, not, not all of his cabinet officers thought he should move in that direction, but they all agreed once they heard the argument. And um, uh, he, my, my concern was after Baghdad fell, it should have been obvious that the most important thing to do was to secure the country. And there were some people who thought uh, that it would just sort of snap back in place. There'd be uh, expatriates coming back into the country and suddenly a government would emerge out of the chaos. But they failed to take into account the reality of a country with sectarian differences, serious sectarian differences, Kurds, Shia, Sunni, others, that once you took off Saddam Hussein's pressure, all of that came flying out, and we found ourselves in an insurgency. And we should have understood that that was liable to happen, and we should have had enough troops in there to secure the place and keep that under control. Now, example, General Shinseki, who was chief of staff of the United States Army at that time, was testifying before Congress. And uh, he was asked by one of the senators, how many troops do you think it will take to secure this place uh, after this war? And Rick, a uh, Vietnam hero, lost a foot in Vietnam, a guy who saw peacekeeping in Bosnia, Rick answered, a couple of hundred thousand. And he was shot down the next day by the Secretary of Defense and the day after that by the Deputy Secretary of Defense. He said, we can't imagine they would take that many to keep the peace 
but it didn't take that many to win the war, winning the war in their mind being getting to Baghdad and getting rid of Saddam Hussein. But that wasn't the end of the war. That was the beginning of the campaign. And we didn't think that through. And uh, as a result, it was years later before the president did what? He put a surge of troops in to bring control to the country. If we had done that at the beginning and kept the troops moving in as they were scheduled to and not cut it off because we thought we won, uh, it might have been an entirely different story. Uh, one last question before we open it up to the uh, audience, and that is you write that you're often asked which of the presidents you worked for was the best or the worst and that you don't answer that question. No, they all were my presidents. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't answer that question. And yet, uh, a recent CNN poll showed that George W. Bush has the worst public standing of any living ex-president, the only one below 50%. Is that rating justified? <laughs> hey, you're, you're, the, you're the correspondent. You tell me. I, mean, sure, you, I, will never, I, I don't answer that question because all of them were elected by the American people to be president and commander-in-chief. They all came into office with the very best of intentions for the country. Some were more successful by this kind of a scale than others. But I will discuss the four presidents and tell you what my experience is with them, but I will not rate them or give them grades. I find that uh, not an acceptable thing for me to do as somebody who is either a military commander and chairman under their authority or as a secretary of uh, state under their authority or a national security advisor. Uh, I got stories in each and every one of them, beginning with Reagan and all, and all the way through uh, Bush 43. I have more stories about Reagan than anybody else, though. He's, he's quite a guy. At this point, uh, if there are any questions of the audience, we're happy to entertain them. I don't know exactly how it's working with the microphones. I can, uh, we can hear, ma'am. You'd be surprised what the Army will do for you. Um, <laughs> for, the, for those of you who may not have heard the question, the question was, how did he go from a, uh, a poor student, he's candid about his uh, academic record early on, uh, to someone in his, uh, of his stature and his position? I, I, was a, I was a poor student, but I wasn't a bad guy. I mean, I was, <laughs> I, I was still a nice person, uh, relatively speaking. Um, and uh, I talk about this all the time. I did it at my grandson's high school graduation two days ago in that I was straight C in high school. Um, I got into college, I don't know how, but I got into the City College of New York. I couldn't have gotten in just about anywhere else. And I was a poor student at the City College of New York. And the only thing that held me up were my ROTC grades because in the, in the, in the college, I found ROTC and I found something I loved doing and something I, was, I could do well. I was a good cadet. And I got straight A's in ROTC. It was the only thing that interested me. Dropped out of engineering, went into geology because it was the easiest way to get a bachelor's degree. But it was ROTC that kept me in school, straight A's. They moved them into my GPA. Uh, and when the, the ROTC A's went into my GPA, it brought me up to 2.0. And they said, Good enough for government work. Get them out of here. <laughs> um, and they sent me off to the Army. Now I'm considered one of the greatest sons the City College of New York has ever had. <laughs> They've named a center after me, the Colin Powell Center for Leadership and Service. And so the, the, the whole point of this little story is I tell kids all the time, it isn't where you start in life. It's where you end up. What did you do along the way? Your past is not your present, it's not your future. And so you always have to be improving yourself. You always have to be studying. And when I got in the Army, it was four years after the end of segregation. Segregation finally ended in 1954. The last all-black unit was broken up right after the Korean War. And I got in four years later. The country was still segregated, but the Army wasn't. And you know, I went to the South and lived in segregated areas, but not on post. And what they said to me is, okay, look, you're gonna, you, we'll show you what the Army can do. And don't give us any hard luck stories about being an immigrant kid born in Harlem in the Bronx. We don't care about any of that. And the poor family, I could care less. Only thing we care about now is performance. You perform, you're going to do well. You don't perform, you're not going to do well. Are there any questions, Lieutenant Powell? 
No, I got it. Uh, and I always try to do my best, and that's what I tell, that's what I tell youngsters. Uh, you are not trapped in your past, and uh, you can do what I did. Now, one of the things I did bring with me from, from uh, New York, uh, I grew up in the South Bronx. It was the most diverse neighborhood you've ever seen. We had Eastern Europeans, we had blacks from the South, we had blacks from the Caribbean, we had a large Jewish population, I learned some Yiddish, I learned some Spanish, uh, and so I didn't know what a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant was till I went to Georgia. I mean, we, everybody was something else in my neighborhood. Uh, and we kidded each other constantly about it. There was no, no we, we, with some rough names that you couldn't use now. But I just grew up in this environment of love and caring on the streets of New York with a, a great extended family uh, of, of immigrants that came from Jamaica. I had aunts and cousins and uncles, and they all took care of all the kids. And they didn't care where you went in life. You could be a bus driver, a general, or a doctor as long as you didn't shame the family. And you remember, we have expectations for you. We didn't come to this country so you could stick something up your nose and smoke it or blow it. And um, don't ever shame the family. That was it. And the aunts, the aunt, it was a matriarchal society. And I had all these aunts living throughout the Bronx. And the blocks I walked to come home from school every day, there was an aunt in every other tenement building. <laughs> and these women sat on a pillow they, they leaned on a pillow looking outside and down on the street all day long. They never went to the bathroom. They never cooked. <laughs> and if any one of the cousin kids did anything wrong, bang, they were in trouble. And I, I, you talk about the speed of the internet, the speed of the aunt net was something to behold. <laughs> they would turn you in in a heartbeat. And so you kind of you get raised in, in a loving environment. Lots of fun, lots of drinking, parties all the time loving cousins, and don't shame us, and we have expectations for you. And that's what got me through college, and that's what got me through the Army. And I've been practicing it ever since as best I can. Another question from the audience? <laughs> drop, drop me a line. Uh, PT, and, and they have addresses for me. Uh, PTSD is, is a serious issue. I've never, in, in my many years, I have never seen a conflict or a war that is putting as much pressure on our soldiers as the last 10 years have. World War II, you know, uh, greatest generation. This generation is great. Uh, of our kids in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they're going back over and over and over, over 10 straight years. And they're coming back with a lot of difficulties. PTSD is one. Suicide. The suicide rate is now uh, larger than the casualty rate. Um, broken marriages. A lot of other kinds of emotional and adjustment problems. Crime. Uh, use of guns. And the Army, and mostly the Army and the Marine Corps are faced with this. They're doing everything they can to try to understand this and bring it under control. At the same time, and I hope you will make this a part of your message, the whole force didn't come back with PTSD. Uh, most of the youngsters came back, went right back into their lives, stayed in the Army. Uh, I've been to two posts in the last two weeks, Fort Hood last week and Fort Campbell the week before. And you see these youngsters, and they're just absolutely fine. But we also have special barracks for people who are suffering with PTSD, and the thing that's even more troubling than PTSD is traumatic brain injuries, TBI, because we know how to protect the torso, um, and the kinds of injuries are, tend not to be rifle shots. They tend to be explosions, uh, and that rips off arms and legs and hurts the brain, hurts the head, uh, terrible injuries. And so I hope you will touch on that as well. But don't leave the uh, country with the impression that everybody has come back with PTSD. That would be a, a, not the right impression. D excuse me. Excuse me. We've got to, we've got to move on. Uh, Denny, do we have time for another question from the audience? 
Okay, one more question from the audience. Somebody way in the back there. Okay. Desperately. Secretary, how do you envision the situation with Iran developing? Concerns about Iran and potential advice to the current president. He and I have talked about this on a, on a number of occasions, and my views are probably a little bit different than the prevailing uh, views in, in Washington. Uh, Iran is a country that's in deep economic trouble. Uh, the one serious conversation I had with the Iranian foreign minister while I was Secretary of State, I asked him, what's the number one problem in your country? Expecting him to blurt out something like Israel or America. He said, jobs. We have to create 600,000 jobs a year. We're not doing it. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't see Iran as being 10 feet tall with or without a nuclear weapon. It's a country that is isolated. Nobody is really on its side with respect to nuclear weapons. Now, they keep saying they're only doing this to have a power program to generate electricity. Well, let's test them on it. If that's what you say you're doing, then we'll let you have a power program. Uh, but it has to be with the most intensive inspection regime imaginable, with the IAEA living at every one of your facilities, if that's what you say you're doing. Do I believe them that they uh, only want a power program and it's not going up to be a weapons program? No, I don't believe anything they say. But if we put in place the kind of regime where they can be tested, that might be the solution. Um, it's not clear, and the intelligence community will tell you this, it's not clear that they are going towards a nuclear weapon. But as Israelis will tell you, uh, they'll always have the capability, once they know how to make it for power, they can always go up to making it a weapon. Here's where I become heretical, most people in Washington, D.C. I've lived with nuclear weapons for my whole adult life. As a young officer, I was taught how to employ them, exactly what the damage could be done, what would be done by a nuclear weapon. As a corps commander in Germany, I had them under my, my plans, so that when the Russian army came through, if I couldn't stop them within three days, I would call for nuclear weapons. So I knew how to, I was going to use them. And then as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, I had 28,000 nuclear weapons under my supervision. 28,000. And the Russians had 28,000 or thereabouts. And so the one thing I learned from these many, many years of uh, experience with nuclear weapons is that basically they can't be used. You can deter somebody who has a nuclear weapon or is thinking about it. We did it with the Russians for 40 years. When the Cold War ended and my Russian colleague, Marshal Moiseev, and I really got to talking to each other, I asked him one day, I said, look, you know, I've been studying your security systems, and you've got more security on your submarine launch missiles than I have in mine. How come? You've got another level of security. He says, Golan, we lost 40 million people in the Great Patriotic War, World War II. We didn't want any accidents. These things can't be used. We destroy ourselves. We destroy the world. And so I don't think they are that useful as a weapon anymore. doesn't mean I'm going to encourage people to have them. I just don't think we should go crazy. I think that Iran and North Korea have the same objective, to stay in power. And the easiest way to not be in power is to use one of those things and see what happens the day after. I once gave a, uh, testified before Congress, and they were going on the same thing about North Korea. I said, it's very easy. The day after they use one of them, um, I'll turn uh, Pyongyang into a charcoal briquette. Um, and they, they heard what I said, and I meant it. And so we, we sometimes underestimate the, the power that we have with our deterrence forces. And uh, people say, ah, oh, yeah, but they're both crazy. The Iranians and the uh, North Koreans are crazy. No, they're not. They live in crazy systems. But they are very rational in their crazy system. And the rationality says, we have to stay in power. And if they don't want to remain in power, use a nuclear weapon, and they'll be gone the next day. So I think that by diplomatic pressure on the Iranians, continuing economic pressure especially, and by letting them know that uh, we can contain and deter you and you don't ever want to see what we might be able to do to you, but if you'd like to see it, I'd come over and give you a briefing on what could happen to you. Um, and I think they're deterrable. Um, not everybody agrees with me. They like to say they're crazy. They'll do it just so they can go to heaven with their you know, whatever's waiting for them up there. No, they're not. They want to stay here on Earth and be in power. And that would uh, put them at great risk. Your Indians and the Pakistanis, same kind of thing. I once had to call the Pakistani uh, president, uh, President Musharraf, when he and the Indian 
two armies were facing each other in, in uh, 2002. And he started to say, well, we have means to make sure that we would prevail. And I, I called him, uh, Mr. President, President Musharraf, let's be general and general today, not president and secretary. Okay, general, how are you? Fine, general. Now listen, you're scaring the hell out of everybody with this talk. So you know you can't use them because the Indians have them. They're not usable. So stop saying things like this because you're just making the situation worse. And he did, and we were able to back those armies off in about a couple of months' time. So uh, I am of the view that we ought to get rid of all nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm part of several groups that are for zero nuclear weapons. We brought down our inventories by 75% in the last 20 years. They're horrible. I would like to see them gone from the face of the earth, but until they are gone, we have the capability to deter just about anybody, not just about anybody, but everybody. And the very last question, you endorsed President Obama before the expectation oh, of many quarters break, is you can't be serious. that you will again. Is that I, expectation misplaced? Uh, it's your expectation. Is my expectation misplaced? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm uh, in a wonderful position in that I'm a private citizen, and as I have done for every election in my adult life, um, I watch the candidates, I listen to them, and it's not just the individual. I'm as interested in what's coming in with that individual, what policies, um, what individuals might go into cabinet positions, what are their thoughts about foreign policy, how will they deal with certain issues. So you're just not just electing a president, you're electing a platform, you're electing a whole philosophy of government. And so I always measure that carefully and then I decide who I'm going to vote for. Um, and that's what I have done throughout my career. And I voted for Democrats, I voted for Republicans. Uh, except for President Obama, the earlier, the previous 20 years was all Republicans. And so that's what I will do again this year. See what's best in my judgment for the country. And that's what I will, uh, that's how I will vote. Whether I will share my vote with uh, somebody beforehand, as I did last time, uh, that I will decide as the uh, summer unfolds. But I'm on a book tour right now, not a political campaign. I know there's never a difference. You had to do it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Round of applause for General Paul, please.